Okay, Vittorio. So, welcome everyone to this Safi webinar. So today uh, we have the pleasure of having with us a uh, Hanish Pace from the Dortmund U University. Uh, so Hanig is an uh, expert on neutrino physics. Actually, his research ranges from to several topics in high energy physics, like neutrino physics, gravity, uh, from the fundamentals of uh, quantum mechanics and so on. Uh, so let me uh, see my, okay. I have uh, some notes about uh, some uh, things, a few words about uh, uh, Harish trajectory, but I cannot find with this confusion. Anyway, uh, Harish is uh, uh, a big accomplished uh, researcher. He's also author of some uh, books like uh, The Perfect Wave and uh, more recently The One. And today he's going to tell us about neutrinos, quantum gravity, and the big questions. So it's a, it's really a big pleasure, Harris, to have you here with us. Thanks for accepting our invitation. And please uh, go ahead with your seminar. Yeah, thank you for the invitation to speak here. Um, as you just said, the topic of the talk is neutrinos, quantum gravity, and the big questions. Uh, new ideas for new data. So you probably wonder uh, what are the ideas and uh, what are the data? Um, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so um, this is the uh, brief summary uh, of my assessment of the state of the art in particle physics. So um, what's bad is that we have persistent open questions in fundamental physics. We have the electroweak hierarchy problem. We have the cosmological constant problem. We have the quantization of gravity, which has not been uh, successfully um, performed yet. And uh, we have dark sectors about which we know very little. At the same time, we have no new physics at the LHC and now data about quantum gravity. But um, that's only one side of the problem. Uh, there's also the good side. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, on the good side, we have an increasing amount of precision data in particle physics and um, particle astrophysics data actually probe physics over extreme distances and energy ranges, um, especially gravitational waves and neutrinos. So this picture here is um, from the recent IceCube announcement uh, where they uh, identified neutrinos from the Milky Way disk and complemented the existing data in the radio and optical wavelengths and in gamma rays with neutrinos. Okay, can we go to the next slide? So um, why are neutrinos especially interesting when we want to learn about fundamental physics, when we want to learn about quantum gravity. Well, neutrinos may break lepton number via Majorana masses, as you probably know. On the other side, gravity is expected to break global symmetries. So there's a connection here. Then gravity is expected to reveal itself at high energies and cosmological scales, while the tiny masses of neutrinos may be associated uh, to a high energy scale, for example, in CSOR neutrino models. And um, as I just mentioned, we have um, data at very high energies of neutrinos that traveled cosmological distances and neutrino telescopes. So here are the famous Ernie and Bird uh, events shown. And then finally, neutrinos are interacting weakly only, which makes them perfect quantum probes. And quantum mechanics on the other side may be directly related to quantum mechanics, uh, for example, in the context of emergent space-time scenarios where we have buzzwords like ER equal to EPR, meaning wormholes, Einstein-Rosen bridges are the same as uh, entanglement uh, the einstein podolsky rosen paradox. Uh, so um, 
neutrinos um, are linked to gravity and quantum mechanics in various ways, and that makes neutrinos uh, particularly interesting messengers to um, yeah to look for gravitational or quantum gravitational effects. Can we go to the next slide? So in principle, there are two directions how we can um, yeah connect uh, gravity and quantum physics. We can use gravity to improve our understanding of quantum physics or quantum field theory. And a very interesting example I want to talk about is UV IR mixing from gravity that constrains the validity of quantum field theory. And uh, then we can go in the other direction and use quantum physics to improve our understanding of gravity. And then neutrino oscillations are very good probes. Uh, since neutrino oscillations actually can probe oscillations, fluctuations, and horizons of space-time. More concretely, I want to talk about the following ideas. Yes, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, about uh, UVIR mixing from gravity constraint the validity of quantum field theory, I want to talk about how UVIR mixing may uh, help to solve the electroweak hierarchy problem and how UVIR mixing may be probed in radiative neutrino mass models, and about how neutrino oscillations probe oscillations, fluctuations, and horizons of space-time. I want to talk about how quantum gravitational decoherence uh, can probe dark sectors, and how uh, neutrino oscillations can actually act as a gravitational wave detector. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so I start with UVIR mixing and the electroweak hierarchy problem. A brief recap of the electroweak hierarchy problem. If we look at the one loop contributions to the Higgs mass, we get contributions from scalars, from gauge bosons, and from fermions, shown here as the different loops in the uh, illustration on the top of the slide. And um, they correspond to various contributions to the Higgs mass squared. And um, what is interesting is if we uh, evaluate the loop diagrams here, um, the contribution to the Higgs mass squared scales at the cutoffs of the standard model squared. So um, this means the uh, correction to the Higgs mass squared from these loop contributions should be of the order of the cutoff of the standard model squared. Now, we know the standard model is not infinitely valid since um, at some point we will have gravity, which is not incorporated in the standard model. So if we choose the cutoff to be the Planck mass, then we would expect to be the correction of the Higgs mass to be of the Planck mass, and this would dominate the Higgs mass. So the Higgs mass would be expected to be of the order of the Planck mass, which is 10 to the 17 orders of magnitude bigger than the observed Higgs mass around 125 GeV. So this implies that um, within the standard model, unnatural cancellations would be required uh, to have a Higgs mass of the order of uh, 125 GeV with a cutoff scale uh, lambda of the order of the Planck scale or any large scale. Next slide, please. So there are several traditional solutions to this problem, most prominently supersymmetry, where we introduce SUSY partners, a uh, fermion partner for every standard model particle or for every um, yeah, um, a scalar partner for every standard model fermion, uh, and a um, uh, fermionic partner for every standard model boson, and then the cancellations of bosons and fermions in the loop diagrams uh, contributing to the Higgs mass can cancel a buffer SUSY breaking scale. Uh, this typically is chosen at the order of one TeV. And uh, then one would expect that supersymmetric partners of the standard model particles get produced at this scale. Another possibility are large extra dimensions. In large extra dimensions, gravity can leak out in these extra dimensions of space-time, uh, which means that um, the 
uh, that gravity um, gets diluted uh, faster than usually expected in three dimensions. And this lowers the Planck scale. And if this works to lower to the Planck scale to the order of one dV, uh, we can suppress the quantum corrections to the Higgs mass. Or we could have uh, compositeness or technicolor where the Higgs is assumed to be composite. And then the decomposition of the Higgs particle produces a cutoff scale, which could be much smaller than the Planck scale. A problem of all these traditional solutions is that so far uh, the LHC has probed um, physics way above the 1 TeV scale and no physics had be has been found. So these solutions become increasingly unnatural themselves. Next slide, please. Then there's an unpopular solution, the so-called entropic principle. Uh, this is based on the observation that string theory predicts a vast landscape of possible solutions. A uh, number floating around is something like 10 to the 500 vacua, all with different laws of physics. And an early universe inflation, supposedly this uh, landscape can be populated in an arbitrary number of um, baby universes. And uh, then uh, we end up with a multiverse in which our universe is only one among many universes. And among them, we are supposed to find ourselves in a universe that allows for the existence of ourselves or of some kind of observers. Um, just in the sense that, for example, fish should not be surprised to um, live in water, since um, if they weren't in water, they wouldn't live at all. Uh, there are some problems with this um, entropic principle. First, uh, it's not really clear uh, that the hierarchy problem is really entropic. So for example, uh, people have uh, studied weakless universes, which are compatible with structure and star formation. And um, so maybe we don't need a small Higgs mass for uh, observers or humans to exist and observe the universe. And moreover, I think this is not really an explanation. So um, yes, for example, if we go back to the fish example, fish should not be really surprised to find themselves in water. Uh, but this is not the explanation why there's water on Earth, for example. There are better explanations why there's water on Earth. And um, so, uh, at least in my opinion, the entropic principle is not really an explanation for any fine tuning, but rather a possible explanation for why we could, could not find an, a real explanation. So this is somewhat unsatisfactory and um, I would be willing to uh, look for a better explanation. Next slide, please. Uh, Another option, which is not often discussed, is that maybe the hierarchy problem is an indication of a breakdown of our usual way to do particle physics with quantum field theory or with specifically effective field theories. Next slide, please. So what is the quantum field theory or effective field theory paradigm and what are its limitations? Um, the uh, basic assumption of um, effective field theory is that particle physics is accurately described by an effective field theory with an ultraviolet cutoff, which is below the Planck scale or at the Planck scale. And then uh, by defining uh, an effective field theory, substructure and degrees of freedoms at shorter distances, shorter than this cutoff can be ignored and physics effects can be described by local operators involving only light degrees of freedoms, as long as the momenta and field strengths are much smaller than the cutoff. Um, typical example from neutrino physics is the seesaw mechanism. So um, the most prominent model to generate neutrino masses is to introduce a right-handed neutrino, and then we can couple our left-handed neutrinos to right-handed neutrinos and the Higgs and then the right-handed neutrino can obtain 
a large Majorana mass since um, it is a gauge singlet, so it doesn't need symmetry breaking to possess a Majorana mass. And then we can couple the right-handed antineutrino again to a Higgs wave and a left-handed antineutrino or, or uh, the antineutrino corresponding to the standard model left-handed neutrino, which is of course the right-handed antineutrino. And then we get an effective mass uh, for the light neutrino, which scales like the Higgs wave squared over the mass of the heavy neutrino in the propagator. And in effective field theory, we can describe this as our neutrino coupling to a blob and the blob couples to two um, Higgs waves. And uh, the blob is a dimension five operator, so it's suppressed by a large mass scale, which in the seesaw one example would be the mass of the right-handed neutrino. But there are other diagrams that are possible and would, that give the same dimension five Weinberg operator. For example, instead of a right-handed neutrino, we can introduce a Higgs triplet and couple that to, to Higgs waves. And then if the Higgs triplet is heavy, we get the same seesaw formula. This is called seesaw two. And in effective field theory, we get the same dimension five Weinberg operator. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, tested assumption uh, in these procedures is that higher energies correspond to shorter distances and that these shorter distances are more fundamental. But uh, as has been observed already a couple of times, uh, this at some point will break down. For example, if we are at very high energies, much above the Planck scale, then we will be able to create black holes and particle collisions. And uh, the black hole will grow with energy, which means that uh, yeah, shorter distances are hidden behind the black hole horizon and higher energies from that point when we create a black hole correspond to larger distances since the black hole increases with energy. Next slide, please. So it makes sense uh, to assume that quantum field theory or effective field theory breaks down at a UV cutoff lambda. But the question is, what is lambda? And the question is, what about the infrared? And um, there exists a very interesting paper by Andrew Cohen, David Kaplan, and Ann Nelson from almost 25 years ago where they um, studied black hole physics to address these questions. And um, they essentially uh, looked back at old arguments from Hawking and Bekenstein in the 1970s. So in 1971, Hawking realized that the uh, horizon area of a black hole is always growing. And uh, a couple of years earlier, Werner Israel had found the black no hair theorem uh, stating that a stationary black hole is completely characterized by three quantities, which are mass, charge, and angular momentum. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this led to the question whether this uh, imposes a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. So what happens to entropy falling into a black hole? And Bekenstein uh, suggested that the growth of the black hole horizon compensates for the loss of entropy behind the black hole event horizon, uh, which led to the first law of black hole mechanics. So the change of the black hole mass is uh, proportional to the change of the black hole entropy. And um, also to the holographic bound, which says that the maximum information in the spacetime region V with, would be the information in the black holes and the black hole is the most dense uh, matter configuration we could think of. And uh, the maximum information in the space-time region grows with the uh, entropy of the black hole, which corresponds to the area of the black hole, not the volume of the black hole. Uh, so it grows with the length to the power of two. And this obviously is a contradiction to standard quantum field theory, where we typically assume that the information in a volume grows with the volume with the length to the power of three. 
Okay, next slide, please. And this creates an infrared cutoff for quantum field theory. Since if we go to larger length scales, at some point we need, we, we reach a cutoff length scale where L to the power of three is larger than L to the power of two. And um, starting from this point, quantum field theory will overcount degrees of freedom. So we get both an infrared cutoff and an ultraviolet cutoff for quantum field theory. And quantum field theory works only in between these two cutoffs. Next slide, please. Um, Cohen, Kaplan, and Nelson then went on and said, uh, the bound from black hole entropy still contains many states with Schwarzschild radius larger than the size of the box where my meta configuration is located, uh, which would mean that even low energy particles can collapse into black holes. And this obviously we cannot describe with standard quantum field theory. And to avoid that, they um, proposed a more stringent bound to exclude all states with Schwarzschild radius larger than the box size. And this gave a, a, a smaller infrared cutoff, which is the Schwarzschild horizon, which is two times Newton's constant times the mass uh, of my meta configuration. And uh, Newton's constant, of course, is one over two times the Planck's mass squared. Uh, so um, when we now configure, consider a configuration of maximum energy concentration describable in quantum field theory without gravity, uh, we can think of a box of minimal volume. This is uh, our infrared cutoff to the power of three uh, filled with maximum energy density. Uh, this must be maximum volume actually. So. Uh, filled with our maximum energy density, which is uh, the maximum energy lambda over the minimum volume, no, the minimum volume, lambda to the power of minus three. So this is lambda to the power of four. Next slide, please. So uh, plugging these things in to um, our formula for the Schwarzschild radius, we get a Schwarzschild radius, which is lambda to the power of four, infrared cutoff length scale to the power of three over Planck scale squared. And this is the infrared cutoff LER. And we can solve that for LER. And we get our infrared cutoff length scale at the Planck mass over the ultraviolet cutoff squared. So that means not only we have now an ultraviolet and an infrared cutoff for quantum field theory, uh, these two cutoffs are actually related. And if you look more closely at this formula, we see that this already implies that the ultraviolet cutoff has to be really smaller than the Planck mass. It can't be at the Planck mass, since if lambda is equal to the Planck mass, then also the infrared cutoff is at the Planck mass. So we have a zero range of validity for quantum field theory. So if we want to have any range where we can do quantum field theory, without gravitational corrections, then the ultraviolet cutoff should be below the Planck scale. And we also see the larger the infrared cutoff length scale, the smaller is lambda and vice versa. Next scale, slide, please. Um, this has some intriguing consequences. And uh, one consequence was proposed by CKN when they um, applied this to the dark energy density in the universe. Uh, so the dark energy density in the universe has another fine tuning problem, the so-called cosmological constant problem. Uh, if we look at uh, vacuum fluctuations that contribute to the dark energy density, then uh, these vacuum fluctuations also scale with the ultraviolet cutoff scale which arguably would be the Planck scale to the power of four for energy density. And this would be some uh, 120 orders of magnitude too large. I mean, 
Uh, people have argued that with clever renormalization, one can come down maybe to 55 orders of magnitude, but that's still a very, very bad prediction, of course. Uh, what CKN found out is if they uh, adopt an inter infrared cutoff length scale of the order of the inways was Hubble horizon, uh, then they get a corresponding ultraviolet cutoff scale of the order of 10 to the minus three electron volt. And this is just in agreement with the observation of the actual dark energy density in the universe. So this works very nice. So in principle, this could suggest a solution to the cosmological constant problem. Next slide, please. Excuse me, uh, Heinrich. And yes. uh, but this, uh, this ultraviolet uh, cutoff scale is uh, so small. What uh, uh, does it imply for uh, the application of quantum field theory? <laughs> uh, this is a, a four-dimensional cutoff or um, extra-dimensional cutoff? No, it's a, it's a four-dimensional cutoff. Four-dimensional. So yeah. then... But, but um, typically, usually, um, one does not... This is, I mean, it's it's a good question. And um, I, I think it's it's still an open question what, what it really means. Uh, uh, at face value, it only means um, if I want to do a calculation in quantum field theory, I have these two cutoffs, and um, I can choose them in a way to minimize uh, any corrections from quantum gravity in my calculation. Uh, if I want to describe a volume which is as large as the as the observable universe, then I um, adopt the Hubble horizon at the infrared cutoff, then I get such a very small ultraviolet cutoff. But this typically is not considered to be universal. I mean, so of course, you have other cutoffs when you do a calculation for the LHC, of course, and you can't work with a, with a cutoff of 10 to the minus 3 EV. But I'm also not 100% sure that this is 100% uh, consistent since, I mean, if you do different calculations, you you look at uh, interference processes, and I'm not sure whether you can uh, discuss interference between different processes with different cutoffs and so on. So so yeah, I I think this this suggests that this cutoff can't be universal. It it has to be particle or process dependent, but um, I'm not hundred percent sure how how consistent it is. Um. Yeah, another possibility would be, of course, that that uh, this cutoff has been chosen too low and it, it doesn't solve the, the cosmological horizon problem if you want to have a universal cutoff. But even then, I mean, if you if you really want to have a universal cutoff, uh, you get very interesting consequences. For example, if you say, OK, I want to describe quantum field theory at energies at as low as uh, one electron volt, since we can describe atomic physics with quantum field theory, then we get an ultraviolet cutoff of 100 TeV, which would mean that we could see quantum gravitational effects at the FCC. So um, yeah, I think um, this this triggers lots, lots of interesting questions. And um, yeah, not they, they, they are not, uh, yeah, it's satisfactorily resolved yet. Um, anyway, the, the paper by Cohen, Kaplan, and Nelson gets more and more prominent. So this is a plot of the citations here, and this almost almost looks like, like exponential, if I would fit it. Um, the dip in 2022 uh, is not a real dip since I made this uh, picture uh, somewhere before the end of 2022. So uh, if if I would have um, done it until the end of 2022, the, the curve would be rising uh, still. OK, next slide. Um, yeah, as, as I just um, discussed with Sergey, there are open questions. We know the standard model cutoff is not 10 to the minus 3 electron volt. This would create massive problems with phenomenology. Uh, another question is the CKN cutoffs, they are motivated by having quantum field theory without quantum gravity in between, but it's not really clear where they come from. 
Uh, another question is, um, can we generalize uh, this idea to other fine tuning problems, such, such as the electro v hierarchy problem? And um, ideas that have been discussed in the context of the electro v hierarchy problem and UVI are mixing are hidden symmetries and magic zeros that reveal themselves only after all quantum corrections have been summed up and not in the individual contribution. For example, Nima Akhani Hamad has discussed such ideas, or um, Nathaniel Craig and collaborators have discussed these things. Next slide, please. So um, we um, thought we could, um, or our idea was uh, to think uh, if we would take the uh, seeker n solution for the cosmological constant problem series, how could we generalize it to an instable particle as the Higgs particle? Uh, of course, assuming that this is not a universal cutoff, that this is particle specific. And um, what we, what our idea was is to take instead of the cosmic horizon, the, the Hubble horizon, the causal diamond. So the causal diamond is the largest space-time region uh, that can be causally probed in a quantum process. And uh, it corresponds um, to two, uh, two light cones, one um, upward facing light cone that starts at the beginning of the process and uh, one um, downward pointing light cone that ends at the end of the process. And the conjunction of these or intersection of these light cones, uh, this is the causal diamond. Uh, it's a blue area here in this, this um, illustration. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Then um, if we look at the causal diamond for the X particle, uh, the relevant scale for the college of the diamond is uh, the lifetime of the X particle, which is uh, four inverse MeV. And our idea was, since this is the maximum space-time region that can be probed in the finite lifetime of an instable particle such as the Higgs, this would correspond to the Hubble horizon in the cosmological constant problem. So if we use four inverse MeV, at the infrared cutoff length scale, then we get an ultraviolet cutoff of 10 to the eight GeV. Uh, this is um, 11 orders below the Planck scale. So it's uh, better than the Planck scale itself, of course, but uh, of course it's not perfect. It's not really a solution to the fine tuning problem. Next slide, please. Um, we can improve this, however, if we combine this cutoff with a reduced Planck scale. So if you look at the formula at the top of the slide, the Planck scale is in the numerator under the square root. So if we reduce the Planck scale, then we can reduce the cutoff with the same infrared cutoff scale. And um, if we would reduce the Planck scale down to something like 10 to the 6 TV, which is still way above what can be probed, in experiments today, uh, then we get an ultraviolet cutoff scale in the region 100 GeV to 1 TeV. Uh, so um, this is interesting. I mean, we could see the effects of this cutoff uh, also maybe in other processes, not only in the uh, quantum corrections to the Higgs, other processes related to the Higgs, and uh, we would see quantum gravity beyond, below 10 to the 6 TeV. Um, so this is, of course, way above what we can test directly with experiments today. But maybe it's it's not totally out of range if we think of uh, precision measurements at future uh, experiments. Um, OK, um, so if this is true, then then maybe the absence of new physics at the TV scale is the new physics, since the absence of the new physics indicates that our standard way of quantum field theory uh, has to be reconsidered. Next slide, please. Um, 
question is, of course, is this more than numerology? Um, Nima, in his talk um, two years ago at Harvard, uh, when he talked about UVR mixing, he said something like the anti-reductionist paradigm is basically wrong. Uh, I think this is maybe uh, uh, it's like maybe a little uh, yeah exaggerated, um, but what I think is uh, that we have to question the tacit assumption of quantum field theory that higher energies correspond to shorter distances and that shorter distances correspond to something which is more fundamental. So maybe uh, some. Uh, uh, well, we have seen already that for black hole production, the first part of um, yeah this rule doesn't apply anymore. Uh, the question is, do shorter distances still are still more fundamental? Uh, since, of course, the statements complex things can be reduced to smaller, less complex things, and complex things can be reduced to more fundamental, less complex things, they are not necessarily the same. Next slide, please. And um, to me, this reminds strongly of entanglement. So uh, for example, if we look at the standard example of, of an entangled state, the bad singlet state, one over square root of two, spin up, spin down, minus spin down, spin up. Uh, this is an entangled pure state. So the von Neumann entropy is zero. And um, if we now, uh, concentrate on the left spin, then uh, we have to, uh, yeah, we have to um, calculate a reduced density matrix, uh, which corresponds to um, decoherence that can be described by tracing over an environment. And uh, we get something like um, the reduced density matrix in the lower right corner of the slide, uh, which then describes a mixed state with non-zero entropy. Next slide, please. So um, here we have an entropy larger than zero if we look at a constituent. Now, if entropy is a measure of ignorance, as we understand it usually, then the entangled bound state has a lower entropy, entropy zero, compared to the constituent which has a finite entropy and is more fundamental than the constituent. So maybe we should not look at constituents uh, when we look for the fundamental description of the universe. And um, maybe we should look at the universe as a whole, as an entangled quantum state uh, where substructures only created via decoherence uh, from the perspective of a local observer. So this is the topic of my new book, the one, if you're interested. So this is the only thing I want to talk about, uh, the only only thing uh, I want to say about the book. Um, next slide, please. Here I want to go on and argue that this actually may be related to hidden symmetry. So if you look again at the belt singlet, uh, this is totally anti-symmetry. So it's, it has an anti-symmetry that is not apparent from the constituents. So if you look at the left skin, spin, uh, it is uh, totally um, yeah, not obvious why the left spin always points in the opposite direction at the right spin. Uh, we only understand that when we look at the complete entangled state. Uh, now, of course, in quantum mechanics, various choices of Hilbert space bases are possible. And so um, entanglement can happen also in momentum space. And this may, be, may constitute a hidden symmetry between the various contributions to quantum fluctuations as they um, contribute to the Higgs mass. Now, it is actually well known that interacting quantum field theories give rise to momentum space entanglement and um, also that entanglement entropy can serve as an order parameter for symmetry breaking. Next slide, please. So combining this with our idea, uh, 
this looks quite cute since the causal diamond uh, is not only the maximum space-time area that can be probed by a process, but it also defines an observer-independent environment for the coherence. And the reason is that the uh, upper boundary of the upper light cone is a one-way membrane for information. All information that goes through the upper light cone is lost for the process since it can't return into the causal diamond before the process is over. And um, that means uh, if you look at that from the perspective of quantum mechanics or decoherence, we have to trace over this information. And um, so this defines some minimum decoherence. And um, then if we say we trace out over the rest of the universe, which is outside our ca causal diamond, then the smaller the causal diamond, the larger the space-time regions traced out and the larger the symmetry breaking effect. And if the X mass or scalar masses in general are protected by some hidden symmetry related to momentum space entanglement and broken by decoherence, then this goes in the right direction that uh, the smaller the causal diamond, uh, the larger the symmetry breaking effect and the larger the resulting X mass. Next slide. Okay. Okay, kind of excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a bit confusing. Uh, what is the symmetry uh, in this Bell state? Uh, it is anti-symmetric, but uh, what is the symmetry uh, uh, of the theory? Uh, yeah, I, I I don't know. I mean, it's 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 very speculative. I I, I agree. Uh, okay, you the, just the only idea play is with this fact. The okay. only idea is that you have I see, I see. a symmetry, okay. which uh -huh. which is not apparent. From the individual contribution, yes, to but class, appearance uh, from the coherent state, all the yeah. different yes, contributions. Yes. Thank you, yeah, and yeah. and that this symmetry somehow protects the X mass, but but I don't have uh, more um, more uh, yeah more um, accurate picture in mind. I mean, this this is this is the very vague idea, but. I think it could go in this direction. Yeah, I have a question. I also sure. think the symmetry should be SU two. I mean, the usual. Uh, yes, yes, for 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 the for the for the bell state, of course, right? For the right. bell state, of course, it's, it's the usual SU two symmetry, and that yeah. we have a singlet and under SU two, right? And yeah. Question but if, if we look look at one of the constituents, yeah. then. Um, we don't know that this is a constituent of a singlet. So this, the symmetry is not obvious from looking at the constituents. Yeah, okay. And, course, and this is the reason course, why we talk okay. about things like- it's like the uh, basis of entanglement. Yeah, yeah, this is the reason why we talk about spooky action at a distance, right? But then yeah. the, the idea is that we can translate this idea to momentum space. And then also in momentum space, we can have a symmetry which is not apparent from the constituents, from the individual contributions at a certain momentum, but a symmetry which somehow uh, acts on, on all momenta together. The other, the other question I have about the coherence. I mean, for, in order to have the coherence, you have to have some interaction with something so that the, I know the different parts to get the you know, the faces are you know, are more random. I mean, they are destroyed between the different components. Yeah. I mean, that's my idea of the coherence. I don't know. If... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but but you always have gravity as a. What's interaction right? here? Gravity. What right. is the interaction here that you are considering in order to have the coherence? Well, I mean, yeah, it's it's. What, for example, gravity or or everything, uh, I mean, everything that that gets radiated off a Higgs particle in this causal diamond and which crosses this boundary here has to be traced over since it can't come back. It's 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 lost information. So, yeah. But I mean, yeah, for, for free Higgs, you, you still have gravity. And uh, 
Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, now maybe a little bit more down to earth. How can we probe these ideas uh, about the CK inbound? And um, next slide, please. So uh, an idea we explored uh, was uh, to look at uh, radiative neutrino mass models. So uh, already in the original Cohen, Kaplan, and Nelson paper, um, the effect on the anomalous magnetic moments of electrons and muons was studied. And um, we thought, well, maybe we get uh, uh, a large effect also on radiative neutrino mass models, since uh, here the loop contribution is the leading order. So it's quite relevant uh, how these loops are changed if we apply these infrared and ultraviolet cutoffs. And um, together with my student, Patrick Adolf, and with Martin Hirsch, we looked at uh, four different neutrino mass models, which generate neutrino masses on one loop, the scotogenic model, the inverse scotogenic model, the Z model, and the scoto singlet model. And we choose, chose these four models since um, they are uh, representatives of four different topology classes that exist for one loop neutrino mass models. Next slide, please. And um, yeah, then we applied the ultraviolet and infrared cutoffs. And um, what we found is, depending on where these cutoffs are, uh, they can make quite a difference. So we see here for low ultraviolet cutoffs and for large ultraviolet cutoffs, we get a steep drop uh, in uh, these integrals which are uh, responsible to create the neutrino masses. So this is the ratio shown here between the integral with cutoffs over the integral without cutoffs. And we see with cutoffs, the integral can be much smaller than with cutoffs. So this means the corresponding neutrino mass would be much smaller. And this means of course, that the entire parameter space of the model changes since uh, the new particles in the model, they have certain allowed ranges of parameters assumed that they create the observed neutrino masses. And uh, these ranges of parameters are then uh, compared to bounds from, for example, the LHC or whatever. And um, now what we see here is that with these cutoffs, the situation changes. Next slide, please. Uh, same situation in these other models, the C model, the inverse scotogenic model, and the scotogen singlet model, uh, we get uh, quantitatively different, but qualitatively uh, similar results that um, the neutrino masses generated in these models, depending on the cutoff, can be a factor uh, two to 10 smaller when, when we have the cutoffs. Next slide, please. Stanley, may I ask you, but these uh, diagrams are finite. So you just uh, cut anyway, you cut uh, from uh, the above, from the uh, below of, uh, in the integration, uh, uh, in the loop integration. Yeah? Yes, yeah. 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 Just, just from the logic that, I mean, we, we, need to have these two cutoffs to avoid contributions from quantum gravity, but we don't really know where these cutoffs are lying. And, and then we just scanned different possible cutoffs. And um, if, if we go back once more, we also compared these cutoffs uh, with the cutoffs that are allowed uh, by the um, anomalous magnetic moments of the electron and the muon, which are these colored regions here. Okay. Next slide, please. So this means we could get, <laughs> depending on the actual cutoff, of course, order one effects on the generate neutrino mass. So UVI mixing has significant consequences for the parameter space of radiative neutrino mass models. Okay, so much about UVI mixing. Then uh, in the remaining time, I want to briefly talk about how neutrino oscillations can probe, probe oscillations, fluctuations, and horizons of space-time. And the first topic 
as quantum gravitational decoherence. Next slide, please. So what is quantum gravitational decoherence and how is it related to the study of hidden dark sectors? Next slide, please. Uh, once more decoherence. Uh, decoherence um, is a, a process that has been discovered theoretically by Dieter Zeh in 1970, or actually a few years earlier, it has been published in 1970. And um, it is based on the idea that if we look at the universe as a quantum state, next slide, please. And then we split it up into a measurement device, a quantum object and an environment. And uh, then um, next slide, please. We concentrate on the measurement device and uh, the measurement device interacts with the quantum object and interacts with the environment, of course, uh, since it's a macroscopic device, uh, then uh, the environment is the rest of the universe, which is not entirely known to us. So we have to trace over the degrees of freedom in the environment. And this results in a suppression of uh, interference effects. Next slide, please. So uh, this suppression of interference terms looks like a quantum collapse for the observer but it's not really a quantum collapse since the entire object, the universe is still a quantum object. It only looks like something which is quasi-classical for the observer from her limited perspective. And this uh, is one, if not the crucial process in the quantum classical to classical transition, depending on what interpretation of quantum mechanics you favor. Uh, now, in neutrinos, we usually have to deal uh, with wave package separation decoherence. And this is due to the fact that um, neutrinos uh, have an imperfectly measured momentum at the production point. So they are not really plain waves, but wave packages. And these wave packages at some point get separated and then uh, the oscillations are damped and uh, we get a, an asymptotic uh, transition probability, which is half the oscillation amplitude. OK, next slide, please. But uh, decoherence can have more exotic uh, reasons, of course. For example, decoherence can happen at a black hole horizon. And um, then, since the black hole uh, doesn't conserve any global quantum numbers. It just uh, conserves mass, charge, and spin. Uh, in this process, uh, global quantum numbers are broken. Next slide, please. And um, if uh, space-time is quantized, then uh, uh, one typically depicts uh, quantum space-time as having a, some kind of foamy structure where we have uh, virtual black holes or uh, non-trivial topological uh, configurations. And um, these uh, yeah, virtual um, features of uh, quantum space-time can also act as an environment. And uh, then we get decoherence due to quantum gravitational effects of space-time, even for otherwise isolated system. OK, next slide, please. Uh, this um, is actually an old idea. Uh, had been studied extensively by, by Alice and Nanopoulos and uh, collaborators, Nick Mavromatos, for example, uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. This can be modeled as a sink term in the evolution equation, uh, which is uh, here the the term with a with a which which is marked in red, and um, as I said, it's expected to violate all global quantum numbers. Uh, this is also confirmed in the ads CFT context, uh, and um, if we look at neutrino oscillations, it entails a democratic flavor distribution. Since it doesn't discriminate flavors, it uh, 
results in a totally democratic flavor distribution, irrespective of the mixing. And moreover, as I had pointed out uh, in a paper with, with uh, Klaptor Klein Rothaus and Utpal Zaka in 2000 already, uh, this process depends exponentially on the propagation distance. And so there's a great sensitivity at neutrino telescopes. Later papers um, have studied this in more detail. For example, a paper of 2005 by um, Francis Halson with Luis Ankadoki, Heim Goldberg, Concha Gonzalez Garcia, Dan Hooper, Supia Saka, and Tom Weiler. Uh, yeah, so um, if, if one looks for this process, it is quite promising to look at neutrino telescopes. Next slide, please. This formula you wrote there is for, for what? Propagation of what? I missed that. Uh, well, this this is um, just just the um, just the phenomenal uh, equation with the sync term, which which describes this uh, this quantum gravitational decoherence. And um, talking radiation somehow. What? Well, it it just it it doesn't really specify the process. It okay. just says there is some environment uh, which could be virtual black holes or virtual wormholes in some quantum space time that that yeah produces an environment for even for an otherwise isolated system so that yeah. you de get decoherence due to these quantum gravity effects even if, if the system is not interacting via any non gravitational interaction why is it so sensitive to neutrinos i mean what oh um the the point is uh, that um it it depends exponentially on the propagation distance. And then if we have astrophysical neutrinos as an, an ice cube that come from, from active galactic nuclei from other galaxies, then of course we have huge propagation distances and then we get very sensitive. Okay, so um, what we did now is we, we first um, discussed uh, well, we compared these two effects of decoherence, the quantum gravitational decoherence and the standard wave package decoherence that you always have. Uh, so the wave package decoherence that uh, gives uh, an asymptotic flavor ratio, which is uh, yeah given by the by the mixing. Yeah, it's it's just the half the oscillation amplitude, which is in a two neutrino flavor. Uh, framework sine squared to theta half, uh, while the quantum gravitational decoherence uh, gives a total democratic result. It's always one over the number of neutrinos you have. Uh, both effects kick in at uh, large distances, as shown here. Um, next slide, please. But what's more interesting I is when we. Question, sorry. Yeah, sure. You talk about quantum gravitational decoherence. Are you talking about interaction with the with the uh, uh, oscillation of the zero point oscillation of the gravitational field, something like that? Or? Yeah, with, with quantum with quantum oscillations of the of the yeah, gravitational right. quantum oscillation. Yeah. Yeah. So the zero point oscillation. Yes. Oh yeah, quantum. exactly. Yeah, that's the idea. But I mean, this this is not this this is not us who first discussed that, right? But there are lots of papers by by Alice Rednitsky, uh, Nanopoulos, uh, Nick Mavromatos, and so on, uh, who discussed these effects uh, many years ago. Uh, so um, what I want to stress is that it's interesting now to look at these things, since now we have data at neutrino telescopes, and um, yeah. And also, since, since this could be a way to um, get effects of dark sectors also. So what we did now is first we discriminated, or we, we, we discussed both these effects, the standard model, wave package separation decoherence and the quantum gravitational decoherence. And if you look at it as a function of energy, then these we see that these C2 effects uh, disentangle. So the wave package decoherence uh, arises at low energies and the quantum gravitational 
dequerence arises at high energies. Both arise at large distances. But yeah, uh, I have another question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking too much. Um, no, that's, that's okay, of course. Uh, I, I was thinking about the Casimir effect, in which you have a sort of sort of um, the zero point energy fluctuation of the electromagnetic field. Mm -hmm. So, and that depends on the on the distance of the plates. Right. So, the plates are very far away. Then this thing goes away. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Here, I mean, that when when you consider whole space, then, then the fluctuations are essentially not uh, important. Mm, no, I mean, as as I said, we we didn't really model the fluctuations. We just described it as as a as a sink term, and uh, uh, so so all the quantum gravitational information is in the parameters of the sink term. So this this uh, curvy G here. Uh, so so we just looked at it, yeah, as as the sink term in in our evolution equation. We didn't really model the gravitational field or the quantum gravitational field itself. It's it's just the motivation for introducing the sink term. Um, but uh, yeah, um, the, this is not what what creates the the um, the effect on the on the propagation distance but um uh what creates the effect of the propagation distance is simply that that the neutrino uh, can interact with this environment all the time it's propagating and if it's propagating a cosmological distance uh, it has much more possibilities to to interact with this environment and and to decohere than if it just uh exists for for a millisecond or something like that as as other typical quantum processes. Okay. Good. Okay. So yeah. So we can discriminate uh, the two effects here: standard model wave package separation decoherence at low energies, quantum gravitational decoherence at high energies. Next slide, please. And um, then the question is, why is it interesting now? If we looked at it already 22 years ago, well, um, first, um, there's interesting new stuff going on in the quantum gravity community. Uh, recent results about black hole information, uh, emergent space time, firewalls, replica, wormholes, EI equal to EPR and all that stuff uh, that lacks concrete possibilities of experimental testing. So it's interesting to look and effects that could actually, uh, yeah, connect these ideas with experiment. Um, then, as I just said, the uh, discovery of PEV scale extra galactic neutrinos, uh, neutrinos at very high energies that have traveled over very large distances. And another interesting point is that we have mounting cosmological evidence for dark matter without any new particles found at the LHC. So maybe one can connect this effect uh, or study this effect not only as an exotic um, idea related to physics beyond the standard model, but maybe also as a way to use it to study hidden sectors. And this is what I uh, want to um, advocate now in the next few slides. Next slide, please. So um, this is related to the fact that we get a democratic flavor distribution irrespective of the mixing. And so that means that our neutrino oscillation probability will depend on the number of singlet fermions that exist in the universe, uh, even if the mixing is small or, 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 or zero, since uh, the gravitational effect will populate these dark fermions. So if we add n minus two additional dark fermions to our th theory, then um, with, and we have two, two neutrinos, of course, then uh, the asymptotic of our um, oscillation probability is one over n, and we get a, which means that we get a democratic flavor distribution over all neutral fermions. And uh, this, uh, corresponds to a drop in the survival probability, of course, which could be observable. 
Next slide, please. And um, and also, if we look at the total neutrino flux, it would correspond to, to a drop in the total flux in the spectrum. So here uh, are shown the curves for um, three additional dark fermions, 10 additional dark fermions, 20 additional dark fermions. And we see they produce a drop uh, in the flux at the energy where these fermions can be populated. Next slide, please. Um, okay, then we did it also for the three neutrino case, probably not so interesting. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, this is also what I just showed already for the three neutrino case. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, um, also for the three neutrino case, um, uh, yeah, what, what's interesting is that that we have this drop in the uh, in the total flavor ratio. Since if we only look at the um, flavor distribution, uh, the problem is that this democratic flavor distribution is uh, for most typical sources, which are typically pion sources, where we have a pion decaying and two muon neutrinos and an electron neutrino. Uh, this is uh, transformed by the standard model wave package decoherence uh, due to the maximum muon tau mixing into a democratic mixing one to one to one. Uh, so uh, this is, if we just look at the flavor ratios, not easily uh, uh, yeah, distinguishable from these quantum gravitational effects. But what's interesting is that we get these drops in the total flux uh, when we have additional dark sectors. So we can, could do, do two things at the same time here. Uh, we could uh, yeah, search for this exotic quantum gravity effect and at the same time search for uh, dark sectors which are uh, virtually, uh, yeah, uh, what, what what do you measure here? What is that you measure? Because it, the total neutrino flux. You have to know where it was produced. I mean, otherwise, I don't know. What the um, neutrinos were produced, right? Uh, yes. I mean, we uh, neutrino telescopes can now identify sources. So so we we are uh, in the process of actually identifying sources where we can say, oh, this neutrino came from this source, and then we know the propagation distance, and then we can study the, the energy, and then we can look at the, uh, yeah, at, at the total flux or at the flavor ratio as a function of energy and propagation distance and, and really make such analysis. So, I mean, right now we have not many events, of course, but, but yeah, it, th this is coming, so, so. Yeah, like I was saying, you have to know what they were produced. To, to yeah, them. exactly. Yeah, we we have to know that. But there were um, several uh, candidates uh, for 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 events uh, previously, and and now in this year um, we have these events from from the from the center of the Milky Way, right? So so I mean, neutrino telescopes actually are starting to identify the sources of these. Um, yeah. Cosmic neutrinos. Okay. Okay. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, so the last um, idea uh, is still work in progress. Uh, I just want to briefly flash it. So the idea here is that if we have neutrino oscillations and we have a gravitational wave coming through, then this gravitational wave will. Uh, yeah, change the propagation distance of the neutrinos. And um, if this happens in uh, in a way so that we have average to average over it, then this also will lead to a process that looks like decoherence. Next slide, please. So, um, yeah. Uh, Uh, yeah, if, if you look at, at the oscillations here as a function of distance, and then if a gravitational wave comes through, 
it will shrink the space time in one direction and will expand it in the other and then the other way around. And um, that means uh, if we look at, at the plot here, uh, we are at a slightly larger or slightly smaller L. Yeah. And um, so uh, when we are, for example, at an oscillation maximum and uh, we uh, get pushed to a slightly larger L, then we uh, are closer to the oscillation minimum and vice versa. So um, to uh, account for these effects, we have to average over it. And this looks just like wave package uh, or uh, wave package separation decoherence. So that sounds a little bit complicated because you have to you have to somehow I don't know how to say it, but the the, the neutrino have to go through a gravitational wave somehow, you know. Yeah, but the gravitational wave goes through anyway, right? I mean, we we know there are gravitational waves; they propagate yeah, the universe. You have to have an event in which gravitational waves are important, right? Okay, those that were measured, that's like some colliding of like black holes or something like that. Yeah, 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 of course. I mean, of course, but I mean, well, we, we know there, there, there are lots of, of gravitational waves have been have been um detected already. Uh of course, um the question is how 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 rare are they? And um are they important due, during the time scale of a neutrino uh, oscillation experiment? And um, yeah, we we are exploring this right now. But but the basic idea is, if we have neutrino oscillations and a gravitational wave comes through, this will look like wave package separation uh, decoherent, and would mean that neutrino decoherence ar arises at earlier or higher at er uh, or at smaller distances. Or at earlier uh, at at higher energies, and um, so in this sense, neutrino oscillations could act as a gravitational wave detector. Um, we had a, a master thesis about this already in my group. Uh, next slide, please. That looked at these effects, and um, yeah, showed something which looks like expected, but right now uh, we we are putting. Uh, the entire thing on a more solid um, footing with two PhD students of mine, uh, Dominic Hellman and Sarah Krieg. Yeah, and then of course we we have to check uh, does does it work at all? I mean, right now we are still uh, yeah developing the the fundamental uh, uh, the fundamental description, but then of course uh, we we have to check whether um, it really makes an effect on on observable data, and and I don't know the answer. I mean, I I can't really say. I mean, of course, uh, if gravitational waves are so rare uh, that um, yeah, they they don't play a role during the lifetime of a neutrino experiment uh, or a significant role during the lifetime of a neutrino experiment, then this will produce no effect. But I mean, we know there are lots of gravitational waves. Uh, in different frequencies and so on, right? We we don't have only the data from from the uh, uh, gravitational wave interferometers, but we also have the data of these uh, pulsar timing arrays now and so on. So we know gravitational waves exist at various frequencies and energies, and um, yeah, one just has to go through the data and see whether there's any effect. But um, yeah, this is work in progress still. Okay, um, next slide, please. I'm coming to the end of my talk. Uh, so I just flashed some ideas here, which I think uh, are interesting when we want to um, discuss, uh, uh, yeah, or when we when we want to look for random gravitational effects with neutrinos. Uh, the motivation was that we have persistent fundamental problems in fundamental physics, the electric hierarchy problem, the cosmological constant problem, dark sectors, the quantization of gravity. Uh, one uh, topic I looked at was UV-IR mixing, 
U by I are mixing cost by gravity constrains the range of the validity of quantum field theories and produces infrared and ultraviolet cutoffs that are related. Uh, it has been suggested as a solution to the cosmological constant problem. And uh, we looked at causal diamonds to generalize the argument to the electroweak hierarchy problem. Then uh, we also looked at radiative neutrino mass models, which are sensitive to such effects. And uh, then in the second half of my talk, I talked about neutrino oscillations and decoherence uh, that are sensitive on space-time dynamics and space-time fluctuations as an environment. And uh, this may be a powerful tool to search for dark sectors, of course, only if these gravitational effects exist and are observable. But if they exist and are observable, then it may also be used to search for dark sectors. And then finally, uh, I um, argued that neutrino oscillations may act as a gravitational wave detector, although, of course, uh, it remains to be discussed whether this is actually an observable effect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heinrich, by the uh, very interesting and deep uh, talk. So, unfortunately, we had those uh, technical problems. We have a short time for questions. Uh, if anyone has more questions, I have a question. Please. Yes, I missed something because you are saying that neutrino oscillations become decoherent because of space time dynamics and so on. And yes. then you talk about neutrino oscillation as a gravitational wave detector. So, but the coherence was lost, you know, because of the fluctuation. So, so they're, they're not really oscillations anymore. That, uh, I don't know. No, no, it's, I mean, it's, 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 a different, it's a different thing. Uh, first, I said, okay, we can look at, um, at uh, cosmological neutrinos. And if we have these quantum gravitational effects of space time, then we may have decoherence due to these effects. And um, this, of course, is, is somewhat speculative uh, since, since um, we make some assumptions about quantum gravity. Uh, the other effect is just uh, by saying, if we have neutrino oscillations and then a gravitational wave runs through, totally different process, totally different experiment, totally independent argument, then the gravitational wave will sometimes make the propagation distance larger and sometimes smaller. And this corresponds to an averaging over the oscillations. And this also looks like decoherence, although of course it has nothing to do with decoherence since there's no environment involved, but it looks like decoherence. And um, yeah, this effect uh, yeah, could, could, could um, be uh, used as a, as a way to, to look for gravitational waves, maybe. Okay, any other questions? Can you have some effect with other particles? I mean, I know that oscillations are very important, but you think that there would be other effects also with other type of radiation, even with photons. I mean, but. Uh, I don't know what can be measured there, but you were saying that this could be there was some sensitivity to to photons also somehow. I know that. Yeah, I mean, um, you're talking about the the quantum gravitational decoherence or the gravitational waves now. The fact that you have uh, some somehow space-time dynamics that can affect the propagation of different particles. In the case of photons, obviously, I don't know the detail, but I was just thinking there, uh, there might be some effect with comets, uh, background radiation or something like that mm -hmm. there. Yeah, yeah, might be. Might be. Yeah, may maybe maybe a good, good thing to look at. OK, we have time for a last quick question. One question, what three question? Hi, Antonio. Good hi, hi Henry. Nice to, nice to see you. 
Henry, you, when you were talking about um, the hierarchy problem and you mentioned about this uh, large transdimension to lower the cutoff and to try to address the hierarchy problem, mm -hmm. I was uh, wondering why in the, the, the proposal of the valley of about 10 to the 32 copies of the standard model based on the last argument to reduce the cutoff, why it was mm -hmm. not mentioned, or you think that it may these proposals have a lot a strong a strength in explaining the hierarchy problem. What is your opinion about this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I I didn't think so much about it. I mean, uh, I I think it might be interesting to to connect this idea with 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 the stuff I talked about today. Um, since I mean, uh, yeah, some some arguments are similar. Since there, you also talk about. Uh, maximum information and black holes and so on. So so yeah. There there may be in connection, but connection, but but I don't know what it is yet now. I mean I, I, I didn't look at it in detail. Or I mean I didn't look at it at all, I must say. But yeah, might might might, might also be interesting to do. Yes, I think maybe may worth um thinking about that. Yeah. Also because there can be theories of neutrino mass and maybe um, inspired on this 10 to the 32 copy of the standard model. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting, yeah. Thank you, Henry. Thank you so Thank much. You. Okay, so uh, let me thank you again, Henry, by the very nice talk. Thank you. And thank you all in the audience for being here in the webinar. And see you next time. Thank Thanks you. for that. Thank you. <laughs>